Uh, the ancient Greco-Roman world. There are many words that can be used to describe it. And gay is certainly one of them. From Plato's Symposium, in which the playwright Aristophanes gives a myth about the creation of men who desire only men, and women who only desire women, to the 4th century Roman emperor Elagabalus, who had a series of male lovers and allegedly wanted to get what would have been history's first sex change operation. Now, there's a little bit of controversy here that I should probably address. Who can forget Aaliyah's motherly concern for her son, the future Emperor Augustus's sexual development in HBO's Rome? Titus Pullo is here, Dominus. Oh. Tell him I'm unwell. He may come back next week, perhaps. Tell him nothing of the sort. Octavian will be ready to see him in one moment and give him a purse. You've put off this moment long enough, my dear. Mother. You will penetrate someone today, or I will burn your wretched books in the yard. Off with you. The theory many historians and classicists, maybe not as many as there used to be, but still quite a number, hold is that Roman sort of sex between men as being like one huge sleazy prison movie. All that mattered was that the real manly man was the pitcher, and the catcher was some kind of subordinate, like a slave. The argument goes that there was nothing even resembling the idea of sexual orientation, that it was all about power relationships. I mean, yeah, Latin literature is full of things like jokes about thieves getting raped by a god with a giant penis, but there are also, among other things, Greek and Latin astrology books that talk about women and men being born under a certain sign, only ever wanting to have sex with members of their own gender. So bottom line, I do believe the case that the Romans had no concept of sexual orientation depends on a lot of cherry-picked evidence. Plus, it relies on the assumption that even a cosmopolitan place like the Roman Empire, which had all kinds of cultures and philosophical schools running around, would have a pretty monolithic view of something as messy and, well, messy as sexuality. That's not true today, and it most likely wasn't true then. So anyway, I'm more interested in the simple question, did the Romans have a problem with two adult people of the same gender having a sexual relationship? Well, the moralistic and by some odd coincidence really unpopular emperor Domitian was said to have gone after senators who had male lovers. One governor, Saturninus, was even thought to have rebelled because he thought Domitian would have him arrested for having slept with men. Meanwhile, in fiction, the poet Lucian wrote in less than friendly terms about a woman named Megilla, who insists on being called Megillus, has shaved her head, and calls another woman Demonessa her wife. A first century poet Statius wrote a poem mourning the death of the 14-year-old slave Philetus, the lover of his older master, Flavius Ursus. The poem claims that Philetus was physically and emotionally mature for his age. He even had a beard. Also, the satirist Martial, writing about the same time, talks irreverently of a marriage between two fully grown men, Aphor and Calistratus, but is sympathetic when he describes two young men who were lovers but suddenly died. This all brings us to Galba, who is emperor of Rome, for about seven months. Galba came from blue-blooded Roman aristocracy and knew how to suck up to the Julio-Claudians, the one aristocratic family that pulled off the trick of becoming Rome's first emperors. Thanks entirely to them, he had a nice resume, but like so many people, he turned against the last Julio-Claudian emperor, Nero, while Galba was the governor of Spain. He backed a rebellion that failed, but Galba must have been relieved when, instead of getting a soldier sent to take his head, he instead was met by a messenger with the welcome news that Nero had killed himself out of desperation. 
Even more than that, the Senate had elected Galba the new emperor, most likely because the Julio-Claudians were just too good at murdering each other and there were very few left. Galba was, to put it nicely, not an obvious choice. He was 72 years old, hadn't aged well. The Romans, who were not exactly politically correct about ageism, put on satirical plays that highlighted his frail, almost grotesque body. By the time he was emperor, Galba's arthritis was bad enough he could not enroll parchment. The Roman historian Suetonius adds the unpleasant detail that Galba also had some kind of mysterious flap of skin growing out of his left torso, which he had to wrap in some sort of corset. And maybe not that kind of corset. More like a mummy. When he was assured by his lover, Achaelus, that he was to be Nero's successor rather than his latest victim, Galba was said to have kissed Icarus passionately, and then, in Suetonius' own words, took him on one side. And in case you're wondering, Galba never showed that much interest in women. He married only once, fathering two sons who would not live to see him emperor. When Nero's mother Agrippina was interested in making him her next husband after Galba's wife's death, he was uninterested, although it probably helped that his mother-in-law publicly slapped Agrippina for her presumption. Despite having married, according to Suetonius, Galba was inclined toward, quote, unnatural desire and in gratifying it preferred full-grown, strong men. Suetonius's tone about Galba's sexual taste is obviously disapproving, but even then Suetonius doesn't make him look like an effeminate nymphomaniac the way Romans like to portray their least popular emperors. In modern terms, Galba wasn't like a Liberace, he was more like an old-school Goldwater Republican. He made his slaves and freedmen greet him in the morning and say farewell at night. When a group of sailors confronted Galba and then demanded that he keep them in the cushy military jobs Nero gave them, Galba was furious that they would make their demands in such a way. He punished them in what was by then an archaic punishment, decimation, killing a randomly selected tenth while their compatriots were forced to watch. Still, he had a pretty good track record as governor. He was honest in a political culture where taking bribes was just thought to be a job perk. Suetonius said, So his popularity and prestige was greater when he won the empire than when he ruled it. The army hated him because he refused to give the customary gifts on the ascension of a new emperor. To the complaining guards, Galba just grumpily said that he chose his soldiers. He didn't bribe them. The imperial bodyguard, the Praetorians, got the exact same treatment, even though it was their betrayal of Nero that got Galba his gig. Meanwhile, the Senate could not help but complain that despite Galba's reputation for penny-pinching, his officials were a different story. One of the very first things Galba did when he found out he was emperor was making his boyfriend Achaelus an official and it was said that Achaelus had embezzled more in seven months than Nero's officials had in 13 years. The legions in Germany revolted, demanding a new emperor and propping up their own candidate, Vitellius. Galba's biggest blunder was assuming that he was unpopular just because he didn't have an heir. So he nominated Lucius Calpurnius Piso Licinianus, whose blood was every bit as blue as his own. In doing so, he was completely ignoring the career goes of Otho, one of his earliest and most powerful supporters. Otho handled that about as well as you'd expect that any ancient Roman would, and Otho rallied the Praetorians to depose Galba and name him emperor. When the Praetorians came to kill him, it was said that Galba only meekly offered his neck. Galba's head was taken to Otho as proof. Since Galba was completely bald, the Praetorian had to carry his head by its mouth. Otho was now emperor, but the most that could be said about him is that instead of seven months, he lasted only three. But we shouldn't just restrict poor Galba to a footnote. He was not only one of the few Roman emperors who would perhaps identify as gay today, 
but he was the only one in recorded Roman history who was a bear. 